Section 1 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 1. Introductory. Botany is the name of the science of the vegetable kingdom in general, that is, of plants. Plants may be studied as to their kinds and relationships. This study is systematic botany, an enumeration of the kinds of vegetables, as far as known, classified according to their various degrees of resemblance or difference, constitutes a general system of plants. A similar account of the vegetables of any particular country or district is called a flora. Plants may be studied as to their structure and parts. This is structural botany, or organography. The study of the organs or parts of plants in regard to the different forms and different uses which the same kind of organ may assume, the comparison, for instance, of a flower leaf or a bud scale with a common leaf, is vegetable morphology or morphological botany. The study of the minute structure of the parts, to learn by the microscope what they themselves are formed of, is vegetable anatomy or histology. In other words, it is microscopical structural botany. The study of the actions of plants or of their parts, of the ways in which a plant lives, grows, and acts, is the province of physiological botany or vegetable physiology. This book is to teach the outlines of structural botany and of the simpler parts of the physiology of plants, that it may be known how plants are constructed and adapted to their surroundings, and how they live, move, propagate, and have their being in an existence no less real, although more simple, than that of the animal creation which they support. Particularly, this book is to teach the principles of the structure and relationships of plants, the nature and names of their parts, and their modifications, and so to prepare for the study of systematic botany, in which the learner may ascertain the name and the place in the system of any or all of the ordinary plants within reach, whether wild or cultivated. And in ascertaining the name of any plant, the student, if rightly taught, will come to know all about its general or particular structure, rank, and relationship to other plants. The vegetable kingdom is so vast and various, and the difference is so wide between ordinary trees, shrubs, and herbs on the one hand, and mosses, moles, and such like on the other, that it is hardly possible to frame an intelligible account of plants, as a whole, without contradictions or misstatements, or endless and troublesome qualifications. If we say that plants come from seeds, bear flowers, and have roots, stems, and leaves, this is not true of the lower orders. It is best for the beginner, therefore, to treat of the higher orders of plants by themselves, without particular reference to the lower. Let it be understood, accordingly, that there is a higher and a lower series of plants, namely, phanerogamous plants, which come from seed and bear flowers, essentially stamens and pistils, through the cooperation of which seed is produced. For shortness, these are commonly called phanerogams or phenogams, or by the equivalent English name of flowering plants. Cryptogamous plants, or cryptogams, come from minute bodies, which answer to seeds, but are of much simpler structure, and such plants have not stamens and pistils. Therefore, they are called in English flowerless plants. Such are ferns, mosses, algae or seaweeds, fungi, etc., these sorts have each to be studied separately, for each class or order has a plan of its own. But phanerogamous or flowering plants are all constructed on one plan or type. That is, taking almost any ordinary herb, shrub, or tree for a pattern, it will exemplify the whole series. The parts of one plant answer to the parts of any other, with only certain differences in particulars and the occupation and the delight of the scientific botanist is in tracing out this common plan, in detecting the likenesses under all the diversities, and in noting the meaning of these manifold diversities. So the attentive study of any one plant, from its growth out of the seed to the flowering and fruiting state, and the production of seed like to that form from which the plant grew, would not only give a correct general idea of the structure, growth, and characteristics of flowering plants in general, but also serve as a pattern or standard of comparison. Some plants will serve this purpose of a pattern much better than others. A proper pattern will be one that is perfect in the sense of having all the principal parts of a phanerogamous plant, 
and simple and regular in having these parts free from complications or disguises. The common flax plant may very well serve this purpose. Being an annual, it has the advantage of being easily raised and carried in a short time through its circle of existence from seedling to fruit and seed. End of section 1 Section 2 of The Elements of Botany This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray Section 2 Flax as a Pattern Plant Growth from the Seed Phanerogamous plants grow from seed and their flowers are destined to the production of seeds. A seed has a rudimentary plant ready formed in it, sometimes with the two most essential parts, that is, stem and leaf, plainly discernible, sometimes with no obvious distinction of organs until germination begins. This incipient plant is called an embryo. In this section, the flax plant is taken as a specimen, or type, and the development and history of common plants in general is illustrated by it. In flaxseed, the embryo nearly fills the coats, but not quite. There is a small deposit of nourishment between the seed coat and the embryo. This may be for the present left out of the account. This embryo consists of a pair of leaves pressed together face to face and attached to an extremely short stem. In this rudimentary condition, the real nature of the parts is not at once apparent, but when the seed grows, they promptly reveal their character. Before the nature of these parts in the seed was altogether understood, technical names were given to them, which are still in use. These initial leaves were called cotyledons. The initial stem on which they stand was called the radical. That was because it gives rise to the first root. But as it is really the beginning of the stem, and because it is the stem that produces the root, and not the root that produces the stem, it is better to name it the colicle. Recently it has been named hypocotyl, which signifies something below the cotyledons, without pronouncing what its nature is. On committing these seeds to moist and warm soil, they soon sprout, that is, germinate. The very short stem part of the embryo is the first to grow. It lengthens, protrudes its root end, this turns downward, if not already pointing in that direction, and while it is lengthening, a root forms at its point, and grows downward into the ground. This root continues to grow on from its lower end, and thus insinuates itself and penetrates into the soil. The stem, meanwhile, is adding to its length throughout. It erects itself, and seeking the light, brings the seed up out of the ground. The materials for this growth have been supplied by the cotyledons, or seed leaves, still in the seed. It was the store of nourishing material they held, which gave them their thickest shape, so unlike that of ordinary leaves. Now, relieved of a part of this store of food, which has formed the growth by which they have been raised into the air and light, they appropriate the remainder to their own growth. In enlarging, they open and throw off the seed husk. They expand, diverge into a horizontal position, turn green, and thus become a pair of evident leaves, the first foliage of a tiny plant. This seedling although diminutive and most simple, possesses and puts into use all the organs of vegetation, namely root, stem, and leaves, each in its proper element. The root in the soil, the stem rising out of it, the leaves in the light and open air. It now draws in moisture and some food materials from the soil by its root, conveys this through the stem into the leaves, where these materials, along with other crude food, which these imbibe from the air, are assimilated into vegetable matter, that is, into the material for further growth. Further growth soon proceeds to the formation of new parts, downward in the production of more root, or of branches of the main root, upward in the development of more stem and leaves. That from which a stem with its leaves is continued, or a new stem, that is, branch, originated, is a bud. The most conspicuous and familiar buds are those of most shrubs and trees, bearing buds formed in summer or autumn to grow the following spring. But every such point for new growth may equally bear the name. 
when there is such a bud between the cotyledons in the seed or seedling it is called the plumule this is conspicuous enough in a bean where the young leaf of the new growth looks like a little plume whence the name plumule in flaxseed this is very minute indeed but is discernible with a magnifier and in the seedling it shows itself distinctly as it grows it shapes itself into a second pair of leaves which of course rests on a second joint of stem although in this instance that remains too short to be well seen upon its summit appears the third pair of leaves soon to be raised upon its proper joint of stem the next leaf is single and is carried up still further upon its supporting joint of stem and so on the root meanwhile continues to grow underground not joint after joint but continuously from its lower end and commonly it before long multiplies itself by branches which lengthen by the same continuous growth but stems are built up by a succession of leaf-bearing growths such as are strongly marked in a reed or corn stalk and less so in such an herb as flax the word joint is ambiguous it may mean either the portion between successive leaves or their junction where the leaves are attached for precision therefore the place where the leaf or leaves are born is called a node and the naked interval between two nodes an internode in this way a simple stem with its garniture of leaves is developed from the seed but besides this direct continuation buds may form and develop into lateral stems that is into branches from any node the proper origin of branches is from the axle of a leaf that is the angle between leaf and stem on the upper side and branches may again branch so building up the herb shrub or tree but sooner or later and without long delay in an annual like flax instead of this continuance of mere vegetation reproduction is prepared for by blossoming in flax the flowers make their appearance at the end of the stem and branches the growth which otherwise might continue them farther or indefinitely now takes the form of blossom and is subservient to the production of seed the flower of flax consists first of five small green leaves crowded into a circle this is the calyx or flower cup when its separate leaves are referred to they are called sepals a name which distinguishes them from foliage leaves on the one hand and from petals on the other then come five delicate and colored leaves in the flax blue which form the corolla and its leaves are petals then a circle of organs in which all likeness to leaves is lost consisting of slender stalks with a knob at summit the stamens and lastly in the center the rounded body which becomes a pod surmounted by five slender or stalk-like bodies this altogether is the pistil the lower part of it which is to contain the seeds is the ovary the slender organs surmounting this are styles the knob borne on the apex of each style is a stigma going back to the stamens these are of two parts namely the stalk called filament and the body it bears the anther anthers are filled with pollen a powdery substance made up of minute grains the pollen shed from the anthers when they open falls upon or is conveyed to the stigmas then the pollen grains set up a kind of growth to be discerned only by aid of a good microscope which penetrates the style this growth takes the form of a thread more delicate than the finest spider's web and reaches the bodies which are to become seeds ovules they are called until this change occurs these touched by this influence are incited to a new growth within which becomes an embryo so as the ovary ripens into the seed pod or capsule containing seeds each seed enclosing a rudimentary new plantlet the round of this vegetable existence is completed end of section two Section 3 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Corinne LePage. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 3 Morphology of Seedlings. 
having obtained a general idea of the growth and parts of a phanerogamous plant from the common flax of the field the seeds and seedlings of other familiar plants may be taken up and their variations from the assumed pattern examined germinating maples are excellent to begin with the parts being so much larger than in flax that a common magnifying glass although convenient is hardly necessary the only disadvantage is that fresh seeds are not readily to be had at all seasons figure eleven embryo of sugar maple cut through lengthwise and taken out of the seed figure twelve and thirteen whole embryo of same just beginning to grow a the stemlet or collicle which in figure thirteen has considerably lengthened the seeds of sugar maple ripen at the end of summer and germinate in early spring the embryo fills the whole seed in which it is nicely packed and the nature of the parts is obvious even before growth begins there is a stemlet collicle and a pair of long and narrow seed leaves cotyledons doubled up and coiled green even in the seed and in germination at once unfolding into the first pair of foliage leaves though a shape quite unlike those that follow red maple seeds are ripe and ready to germinate at the beginning of summer and are therefore more convenient for study the cotyledons are crumpled in the seed and not easy to straighten out until they unfold themselves in germination the story of their development into the seedling is told by the accompanying figures fourteen to twenty and that of sugar maple is closely similar no plumule or bud appears in the embryo of these two maples until the seed leaves have nearly attained their full growth and are acting as foliage leaves and until a root is formed below there is no great store of nourishment in these thin cotyledons so further growth has to wait until the root and seed leaves have collected and elaborated sufficient material for the formation of the second internode and its pair of leaves which lending their help the third pair is more promptly produced and so on some change in the plan comes with the silver or soft white maple this blossoms in earliest spring and it drops its large and ripened keys only a few weeks later its cotyledons have not at all the appearance of leaves they are short and broad and as there is no room to be saved by folding they are straight except a small fold at the top a vestige of the habit of maples in general their unusual thickness is due to the large store of nutritive matter they contain and this prevents their developing into actual leaves correspondingly their collicle does not lengthen to elevate them above the surface of the soil the growth below the cotyledons is nearly all of root it is the little plumule or bud between them which makes the upward growth and which being well fed by the cotyledons rapidly develops the next pair of leaves and raises them upon a long internode and so on the cotyledons all the while remain below in the husk of the fruit and seed and perish when they have yielded up the store of food which they contained figure fourteen one of the pair of keys or winged fruits of red maple the seed-bearing portion cut open to show the seed figure fifteen seed enlarged and divided to show the crumpled embryo which fills it figure sixteen embryo taken out and partly opened figure seventeen embryo which has unfolded in early stage of germination and begun to grow figure eighteen seedling with next joint of stem and leaves apparent and figure nineteen with these parts full grown and bud at apex for further growth figure twenty seedling with another joint of stem and pair of leaves so even in plants so much alike as maples there is considerable difference in the amount of food stored up in the cotyledons by which the growth is to be made and there are corresponding differences in the germination the larger the supply to draw upon the stronger the growth and the quicker the formation of root below and stem and leaves above this deposit of food thickens the cotyledons and renders them less and less leaf-like in proportion to its amount figure twenty one fruit one key of silver maple acer dasicarpum of natural size the seed-bearing portion divided to show the seed figure twenty two embryo of the seed taken out 
figure twenty three same opened out to show the thick cotyledons and the little plumule or bud between them figure twenty four germination of silver maple natural size merely the base of the fruit containing the seed is shown figure twenty five embryo of same taken out of the husk upper part of growing stem cut off for want of room examples of embryos with thickened cotyledons in the pumpkin and squash the cotyledons are well supplied with nourishing matter as their sweet taste demonstrates still they are flat and not very thick in germination this store is promptly utilized in the development of the collicle to twenty or thirty times its length in the seed and to corresponding thickness in the formation of a cluster of roots at its lower end and the early production of the incipient pumule also in their growth into efficient green leaves the case of our common bean fasciolus vulgaris is nearly the same except that the cotyledons are much more gorged so that although carried up into the air and light upon the lengthening collicle and there acquiring a green colour they never expand into useful leaves instead of this they nourish into rapid growth the plumule which is plainly visible in the seed as a pair of incipient leaves and these form the first actual foliage very similar is the germination of the beech except that the collicle lengthens less hardly raising the cotyledons out of the ground nothing would be gained by elevating them as they never grow out into efficient leaves but the joint of stem belonging to the plumule lengthens well carrying up its pair of real foliage leaves it is nearly the same in the bean of the old world the siafaba here called horse bean and windsor bean the collicle lengthens very little does not undertake to elevate the heavy seed which is left below or upon the surface of the soil the flat but thick cotyledons remaining in it and supplying food for the growth of the root below and the plumule above in its near relative the pea this use of cotyledons for storage only is most completely carried out for they are thickened to the utmost even into hemispheres the collicle does not lengthen at all merely sends out roots from the lower end and develops its strong plumule from the upper the seed remaining unmoved underground that is in technical language the germination is hypogeous figure twenty six embryo of pumpkin seed partly opened figure twenty seven young seedling of same figure twenty eight embryo of common bean fasciolus vulgaris collicle bent down over edge of cotyledons figure twenty nine same germinating collicle well lengthened and root beginning thick cotyledons partly spreading and plumule pair of leaves growing between them figure thirty same older with plumule developed into internode and pair of leaves there is sufficient nourishment in the cotyledons of a pea to make a very considerable growth before any actual foliage is required so it is the stem portion of the plumule which is at first conspicuous and strong growing here as seen in figure thirty five its lower nodes bear each a useless leaf scale instead of an efficient leaf and only the later ones bear leaves fitted for foliage figure thirty one a beech nut cut across figure thirty two beginning germination of the beech showing the plumule growing before the cotyledons have opened or the root has scarcely formed figure thirty three the same a little later with the plumule leaves developing and elevated on a long internode figure thirty four embryo of a pea i e a pea with the coats removed the short and thick collicle presented to view figure thirty five same in advanced germination the plumule has developed four or five internodes bearing single leaves but the first and second leaves are mere scales the third begins to serve as foliage the next more so this hypogeous germination is exemplified on a larger scale by the oak and horse chestnut but in these the downward growth is wholly a stout tap root it is not the collicle for this lengthens hardly any indeed the earliest growth which carries the very short collicle out of the shell comes from the formation of footstalks to the cotyledons above these develops the strong plumule below grows the stout root 
the growth is at first entirely for a long time mainly at the expense of the great store of food in the cotyledons these after serving their purpose decay and fall away figure thirty six half of an acorn cut lengthwise filled by the very thick cotyledons the base of which encloses the minute collicle figure thirty seven oak seedling figure thirty eight half of a horse chestnut similarly cut the collicle is curved down on the side of one of the thick cotyledons figure thirty nine horse chestnut in germination footstalks are formed to the cotyledons pushing out in their lengthening the growing parts such thick cotyledons never separate indeed they sometimes grow together by some part of their contiguous faces so that the germination seems to proceed from a solid bulb-like mass this is the case in a horse chestnut germinating embryo supplied by its own store of nourishment i e the store in the cotyledons this is so in all the illustrations thus far essentially so even in the flax this nourishment was supplied by the mother plant to the ovule and seed and thence taken into the embryo during its growth such embryos filling the whole seed are comparatively large and strong and vigorous in germination in proportion to the amount of their growth while connected with the parent plant germinating embryo supplied by a deposit outside of itself this is as common as the other mode and it occurs in all degrees some seeds have very little of this deposit but a comparatively large embryo with its parts more or less developed and recognizable in others this deposit forms the main bulk of the seed and the embryo is small or minute and comparatively rudimentary the following illustrations exemplify these various grades when an embryo in a seed is thus surrounded by a white substance it was natural to liken the latter to a white of an egg and the embryo or germ to the yolk so the matter around or by the side of the embryo was called the albumen i e the white of the seed the analogy is not very good and to avoid ambiguity some botanists call it the endosperm as that means in english merely the inwards of a seed the new name is little better than the old one and since we do not change names in botany except when it cannot be avoided this name of albumen is generally kept up a seed with such a deposit is albuminous one with none is exalbuminous the albumen forms in the main bulk of the seed in wheat maize rice buckwheat and the like it is the flowery part of the seed also of the coconut of coffee where it is dense and hard etc while in peas beans almonds and in most edible nuts the store of food although essentially the same in nature and in use is in the embryo itself and therefore is not counted as anything to be separately named in both forms this concentrated food for the germinating plant is food also for man and for animals figure forty seed of morning glory divided moderately magnified shows a longitudinal section through the centre of the embryo as it lies crumpled in the albumen figure forty one embryo taken out whole and unfolded the broad and very thin cotyledons notched at summit the collicle below figure forty two early state of germination figure forty three same more advanced collicle or primary stem cotyledons or seed leaves and below the root well developed for an albuminous seed with a well-developed embryo the common morning glory ipomia purpurea figures forty to forty three is a convenient example being easy and prompt to grow and having all the parts well apparent the seeds duly soaked for examination and the germination should be compared with those of sugar and red maple the only essential difference is that here the embryo is surrounded by and crumpled up in the albumen this substance which is pulpy or mucilaginous in fresh and young seeds hardens as the seed ripens but becomes again pulpy in germination and as it liquefies the thin cotyledons absorb it by their whole surface it supplements the nutritive matter contained in the embryo both together form no large store but sufficient for establishing the seedling with tiny root stem and pair of leaves for initiating its independent growth which in due time proceeds as in figure forty four and forty five figure forty four 
seedling of morning glory more advanced root cut away cotyledons well developed into foliage leaves succeeding internode and leaf well developed and in the next forming figure forty five seedling more advanced reduced to much below natural size smaller embryos less developed in the seed are more dependent upon extraneous supply of food the figures forty six to fifty three illustrate four grades in this respect the smallest that of the peony is still large enough to be seen with a hand magnifying glass and even its cotyledons may be discerned by the aid of a simple stage microscope the broad cotyledons of mirabilis or four o'clock with the slender collicle almost encircle and enclose the flowery albumen instead of being enclosed in it as in the other illustrations evidently here the germinating embryo is principally fed by one of the leaf-like cotyledons the other being out of contact with the supply in the embryo of abronia a near relative of mirabilis there is a singular modification one cotyledon is almost wanting being reduced to rudiment leaving it for the other to do the work this leads to the question of the number of cotyledons in all the preceding illustrations the embryo however different in shape and degree of development is evidently constructed upon one and the same plan namely that of two leaves on a collicle or initial stem a plan which is obvious even when one cotyledon becomes very much smaller than the other as in the rare instance of the abronia figures fifty four and fifty five in other words the embryos so far examined are all dicotyledonous that is two cotyledoned plants which are thus similar in the plan of the embryo agree likewise in the general structure of their stems leaves and blossoms and thus form a class named from their embryo dicotyledons or in english dicotyledonous plants so long a name being inconvenient it may be shortened to dicotyls figure forty six section of a seed of a peony showing a very small embryo in the albumen near one end figure forty seven this embryo detached and more magnified figure forty eight section of a seed of barberry showing the straight embryo in the middle of the albumen figure forty nine its embryo detached figure fifty section of a potato seed showing the embryo coiled in the albumen figure fifty one its embryo detached figure fifty two section of the seed of mirabalis or four o'clock showing the embryo coiled around the outside of the albumen figure fifty three embryo detached showing the very broad and leaf-like cotyledons applied face to face and the pair incurved figure fifty four embryo of abronia umbellata one of the cotyledons very small figure fifty five same straightened out polycotyledonous is a name employed for the less usual case in which there are more than two cotyledons the pine is the most familiar case this occurs in all pines the number of cotyledons varying from three to twelve in figures fifty six and fifty seven they are six note that they are all on the same level that is belong to the same node so as to form a circle or whorl at the summit of the collicle when there are only three cotyledons they divide the space equally are one-third of the circle apart when only two they are one hundred and eighty degrees apart that is are opposite in the case of three or more cotyledons which is constant in pines and in some of their relatives but not in all of them is occasional among dicotyls and the polycotyledonous is only a variation on the dicotyledonous type a difference in the number of leaves in the whorl for a pair is a whorl reduced to two members some suppose that there are really only two cotyledons even in a pine embryo but these divided or split up congenitally so as to imitate a greater number but as leaves are often in whorls on ordinary stems they may be so at the very beginning figure fifty six section of a pine seed showing its polycotyledonous embryo in the centre of the albumen moderately magnified figure fifty seven seedling of the same showing the freshly expanded six cotyledons in a whorl and the plumule just appearing monocotyledonous meaning with a single cotyledon 
is the name of the one cotyledoned sort of embryo this goes along with the peculiarities in stem leaves and flowers which altogether associate such plants into a great class called monocotyledonous plants or for shortness monocotyls it means merely that the leaves are alternate from the very first in iris figures fifty eight and fifty nine the embryo in the seed is a small cylinder at one end of the mass of the albumen with no apparent distinction of parts the end which almost touches the seed coat is collicle the other end belongs to the solitary cotyledon in germination the whole lengthens but mainly the cotyledon only enough to push the proximate end fairly out of the seed from this end the root is formed and from a little higher the plumule later emerges it would appear therefore that the cotyledon answers to a minute leaf rolled up and that a chink through which the plumule grows out is a part of the inrolled edges the embryo of indian corn shows these parts on a larger scale and in a more open state figures sixty six to sixty eight there in the seed the cotyledon remains imbibing nourishment from the softened albumen and transmitting it to the growing root below and new forming leaves above figure fifty eight section of a seed of the iris or flower de luce enlarged showing its small embryo in the albumen near the bottom figure fifty nine a germinating seedling of the same its plumule developed into the first four leaves alternate the first one rudimentary the cotyledon remains in the seed figure sixty section of an onion seed showing the slender and coiled embryo in the albumen moderately magnified figure sixty one seed of the same in early germination figure sixty two germinating onion more advanced the chink at base of cotyledon opening for the protrusion of the plumule consisting of a thread-shaped leaf figure sixty three section of base of figure sixty two showing plumule enclosed figure sixty four section of same later plumule merging figure sixty five later stage of sixty two upper part cut off figure sixty six a grain of indian corn flatwise cut away a little so as to show the embryo lying on the albumen which makes the principal bulk of the seed figure sixty seven a grain cut through the middle in the opposite direction dividing the embryo through its thick cotyledon and its plumule the latter consisting of two leaves one enclosing the other figure sixty eight the embryo taken out whole the thick mass is the cotyledon the narrow body partly enclosed by it is the plumule the little projection at its base is the very short radical enclosed in the sheathing base of the first leaf of the plumule figure sixty nine grain of indian corn in germination the ascending sprout is the first leaf of the plumule enclosing the younger leaves within at its base the primary root has broken through figure seventy the same advanced the second and third leaves developing while the sheathing first leaf does not further develop the general plan is the same in the onion figures sixty to sixty five but with a striking difference the embryo is long and coiled in the albumen of the seed to ordinary examination it shows no distinction of parts but germination plainly shows that all except the lower end of it is cotyledon for after it has lengthened into a long thread the chink from which the plumule in time emerges is seen at the base or near it so the collicle is extremely short and does not elongate but sends out from its base a simple root and afterwards others in a cluster not only does the cotyledon lengthen enormously in the seedling but unlike that of iris indian corn and all the cereal grains it raises the comparatively light seed into the air the tip still remaining in the seed and feeding upon the albumen when this food is exhausted and the seedling is well established in the soil the upper end decays and the emptied husk of the seed falls away in maize or indian corn figures sixty six to seventy the embryo is more developed in the seed and its parts can be made out it lies against the starchy albumen but is not enclosed therein 
the larger part of it is the cotyledon thickish its edges involute and its back in contact with the albumen partly enclosed by it is the well-developed plumule or bud which is to grow for the cotyledon remains in the seed to fulfil its office of imbibing nourishment from the softened albumen which it conveys to the growing sprout the part of this sprout which is visible is the first leaf of the plumule rolled up into a sheath and enclosing the rudiments of the succeeding leaves at the base enclosing even the minute collicle in germination the first leaf of the plumule develops only as a sort of sheath protecting the tender parts within the second and third form the first foliage the collicle never lengthens the first root which is formed at its lower end or from any part of it has to break through the enclosing sheath and succeeding roots soon spring from all or any of the nodes of the plumule simple stemmed plants are thus built up by the continuous production of one leaf-bearing portion of stem from the summit of the preceding one beginning with the initial stem or collicle in the embryo some dicotyls and many monocotyls develop only in this single line of growth as to parts above ground until the flowering state is approached for some examples see cycas figure seventy one front at the left a tall yucca or spanish bayonet and two cocoa-nut palms behind at the right form a group of sugar canes and a banana behind end of section three recording by corinne lepage section four of the elements of botany this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com the elements of botany by asa gray section four growth from buds branching most plants increase the amount of their vegetation by branching that is by producing lateral shoots roots branch from any part and usually without definite order stems normally give rise to branches only at definite points namely at the nodes and there only from the axils of leaves buds every incipient shoot is a bud a stem continues its growth by its terminal bud it branches by the formation and development of lateral buds as normal lateral buds occupy the axils of leaves they are called axillary buds as leaves are symmetrically arranged on the stem the buds in their axils and the branches into which axillary buds grow partake of this symmetry the most conspicuous buds are the scaly winter buds of most shrubs and trees of temperate and cold climates but the name belongs as well to the forming shoot or branch of any herb the terminal bud in the most general sense may be said to exist in the embryo as cotyledons or the cotyledons and plumule and to crown each successive growth of the simple stem so long as the summit is capable of growth the whole ascending growth of the palm cycas and the like is from a terminal bud branches being repetitions of the main stem and growing in the same way are also lengthened by terminal buds those of horse chestnut hickory maples and such trees being the resting buds of winter are conspicuous by their protective covering of scales these bud scales as will hereafter be shown are themselves a kind of leaves axillary buds were formed on these annual shoots early in the summer occasionally they grow the same season into branches at least some of them are pretty sure to do so whenever the growing terminal bud at the end of the shoot is injured or destroyed otherwise they may lie dormant until the following spring in many trees or shrubs these axillary buds do not show themselves until spring but if searched for they may be detected though of small size hidden under the bark sometimes although early formed 
they are concealed all summer long under the base of the leaf stalk which is then hollowed out into a sort of inverted cup like a candle extinguisher to cover them as in the locust the yellow wood or more strikingly in the buttonwood or plane tree the leaf scars so conspicuous in figures seventy two and seventy three under each axillary bud mark the place where the stalk of the subtending leaf was attached until it fell in autumn scaly buds which are well represented in figures seventy two and seventy three commonly belong to trees and shrubs of countries in which growth is suspended during winter these scaly coverings protect the tender young parts beneath not so much by keeping out the cold which of course would penetrate the bud in time as by shielding the interior from the effects of sudden changes there are all gradations between these and naked buds in which these scales are inconspicuous or wanting as in most herbs at least above ground and most tropical trees and shrubs but nearly related plants of the same climate may differ widely in this respect rhododendrons have strong and scaly winter buds while in calmia they are naked one species of viburnum the hobble bush has completely naked buds what would be a pair of scales developing into the first leaves in the spring while another the snowball has conspicuous scaly buds vigor of vegetation from strong buds large and strong buds like those of the horse chestnut hickory and the like contain several leaves or pairs of leaves ready formed folded and packed away in small compass just as the seed leaves of a strong embryo are packed away in the seed they may even contain all the blossoms of the ensuing season plainly visible as small buds and the stems upon which these buds rest are filled with abundant nourishment which was deposited the summer before in the wood or in the bark under the surface of the soil or on it covered with fallen leaves of autumn similar strong buds of our perennial herbs may be found while beneath are thick roots rootstocks or tubers charged with a great store of nourishment for their use this explains how it is that vegetation from such buds shoots forth so vigorously in the spring of the year and clothes the bare and lately frozen surface of the soil as well as the naked boughs of trees very promptly with a covering of fresh green and often with brilliant blossoms everything was prepared and even formed beforehand the short joints of stem in the bud have only to lengthen and to separate the leaves from each other so that they may unfold and grow only a small part of the vegetation of the season comes directly from the seed and none of the earliest vernal vegetation this is all from buds which have lived throughout the winter the arrangement of branches being that of axillary buds answers to that of the leaves now leaves principally are either opposite or alternate leaves are opposite when there are two from the same joint of stem as in maples the two being on opposite sides of the stem and so the axillary buds and branches are opposite as in figure seventy five leaves are alternate when there is only one from each joint of stem as in the oak lime tree poplar buttonwood morning glory not counting the seed leaves which of course are opposite there being a pair of them also in indian corn and iris consequently the axillary buds are also alternate as in hickory and the branches they form alternate making a different kind of spray from the other mode one branch shooting on one side of the stem and the next on some other for in the alternate arrangement no leaf is on the same side of the stem as the one next above or next below it but the symmetry of branches unlike that of the leaves is rarely complete this is due to several causes and most commonly to the non-development of buds it never happens that all the buds grow 
if they did there might be as many branches in any year as there were leaves the year before and of those which do begin to grow a large portion perish sooner or later for want of nourishment or for want of light or because those which first begin to grow have an advantage which they are apt to keep taking to themselves the nourishment of the stem and starving the weaker buds in the horse chestnut hickory magnolia and most other trees with large scaly buds the terminal bud is the strongest and has the advantage in growth and next in strength are the upper axillary buds while the former continues the shoot of the last year some of the latter give rise to branches and the rest fail to grow in the lilac also the uppermost axillary buds are stronger than the lower but the terminal bud rarely appears at all in its place the uppermost pair of axillary buds grow and so each stem branches every year into two making a repeatedly two-forked ramification as in figure seventy six latent buds axillary buds that do not grow at the proper season and especially those which make no appearance externally may long remain latent and at length upon a favorable occasion start into growth so forming branches apparently out of place as they are out of time the new shoots seen springing directly out of large stems may sometimes originate from such latent buds which have preserved their life for years but commonly these arise from adventitious buds these are buds which certain shrubs and trees produce anywhere on the surface of the wood especially where it has been injured they give rise to the slender twigs which often feather the sides of great branches of our american elms they sometimes form on the root which naturally is destitute of buds they are even found upon some leaves and they are sure to appear on the trunks and roots of willows poplars and chestnuts when these are wounded or mutilated indeed osier willows are pollarded or cut off from time to time by the cultivator for the purpose of producing a crop of slender adventitious twigs suitable for basket work such branches being although irregular of course interfere with the natural symmetry of the tree another cause of irregularity in certain trees and shrubs is the formation of what are called accessory or supernumerary buds these are cases where two three or more buds spring from the axil of a leaf instead of the single one which is ordinarily found there sometimes they are placed one over the other as in the aristolicia or pipe vine and in the tartarian honeysuckle also in the honey locust and in the walnut and butternut where the upper supernumerary bud is a good way out of the axle and above the others and this is here stronger than the others and grows into a branch which is considerably out of the axle while the lower and smaller ones commonly do not grow at all in other cases three buds stand side by side in the axle as in the hawthorn and the red maple if these were all to grow into branches they would stifle each other but some of them are commonly flower buds as in the red maple only the middle one is a leaf bud and it does not grow until after those on each side of it have expanded the blossoms they contain sorts of buds it may be useful to enumerate the kinds of buds which have been described or mentioned they are terminal when they occupy the summit or terminate a stem lateral when they are born on the side of a stem of which the regular kind is the axillary situated in the axil of a leaf these are accessory or supernumerary when they are in addition to the normal solitary bud and these are collateral when side by side superposed when one above the other extra axillary when they appear above the axil as some do when superposed and as occasionally is the case when single naked buds 
those which have no protecting scales scaly buds those which have protecting scales which are altered leaves or bases of leaves leaf buds contain or give rise to leaves and develop into a leafy shoot flower buds contain or consist of blossoms and no leaves mixed buds contain both leaves and blossoms definite annual growth from winter buds is marked in most of the shoots from strong buds such as those of the horse chestnut and hickory such a bud generally contains already formed in miniature all or a great part of the leaves and joints of stem it is to produce makes its whole growth in length in the course of a few weeks or sometimes even in a few days and then forms and ripens its buds for the next year's similar growth indefinite annual growth on the other hand is well marked in such trees or shrubs as the honey locust sumac and in sterile shoots of the rose blackberry and raspberry that is these shoots are apt to grow all summer long until stopped by the frosts of autumn or some other cause consequently they form and ripen no terminal bud protected by scales and the upper axillary buds are produced so late in the season that they have no time to mature nor has their wood time to solidify and ripen such stems therefore commonly die back from the top in winter or at least all their upper buds are small and feeble so the growth of the succeeding year takes place mainly from the lower axillary buds which are more mature deliquescent and excurrent growth in the former case and wherever axillary buds take the lead there is of course no single main stem continued year after year in a direct line but the trunk is soon lost in the branches trees so formed commonly have rounded or spreading tops of such trees with deliquescent stems that is with the trunk dissolved as it were into the successively divided branches the common american elm is a good illustration on the other hand the main stem of firs and spruces unless destroyed by some injury is carried on in a direct line throughout the whole growth of the tree by the development year after year of a terminal bud this forms a single uninterrupted shaft an excurrent trunk which cannot be confounded with the branches that proceed from it of such spiry or spire-shaped trees the firs or spruces are characteristic and familiar examples there are all gradations between the two modes end of section four Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com Section 5 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray Section 5. Roots It is a property of stems to produce roots. Stems do not produce from roots in ordinary cases, as is generally thought, but roots from stems when perennial herbs arise from the ground as they do at springtime they rise from subterranean stems the primary root is a downward growth from the root end of the collicle that is of the initial stem of the embryo if it goes on to grow it makes a main or tap root some plants keep this main root throughout their whole life and send off only small side branches as in the carrot and radish and in various trees like the oak it takes the lead of the side branches for several years unless accidentally injured as a strong taproot but commonly the main root divides off very soon and is lost in the branches 
multiple primary roots now and then occur as in the seedling of the pumpkin where a cluster is formed even at the first from the root end of the colicle secondary roots are those which arise from other parts of the stem any part of the stem may produce them but they most readily come from the nodes as a general rule they naturally spring or may be made to spring from almost any young stem when placed in favorable circumstances that is when placed in the soil or otherwise supplied with moisture and screened from the light for the special tendency of the root is to avoid the light seek moisture and therefore bury itself in the soil propagation by division which is so common and so very important in cultivation depends on the proclivity of stems to strike root stems or branches which remain underground give out roots as freely as roots themselves give off branches stems which creep on the ground most commonly root at the joints so will most branches when bent to the ground as in propagation by layering and propagation by cuttings equally depends upon the tendency of the cut end of a shoot to produce roots thus a piece of a plant which has stem and leaves either developed or in the bud may be made to produce roots and so become an independent plant contrast between stem and root stems are ascending axes roots are descending axes stems grow by the successive development of internodes one after another each leaf bearing at its summit or node so that it is of the essential nature of a stem to bear leaves roots bear no leaves are not distinguishable into nodes and internodes but grow on continuously from the lower end they commonly branch freely but not from any fixed points nor in definite order although roots generally do not give rise to stems and therefore do not propagate the plant exceptions are not uncommon for as stems may produce adventitious buds so also may roots the roots of the sweet potato among herbs and of the osage orange among trees freely produce adventitious buds developing into leafy shoots and so these plants are propagated by root cuttings but most growths of subterranean origin which pass for roots are forms of stems the common potato for example roots of ordinary kinds and uses may be roughly classed into fibrous and fleshy fibrous roots such as those of indian corn of most annuals and of many perennials serve only for absorption these are slender or thread-like fine roots of this kind and the fine branches which most roots send out are called rootlets the whole surface of a root absorbs moisture from the soil while fresh and new and the newer roots and rootlets are the more freely do they imbibe accordingly as long as the plant grows above the ground and expands fresh foliage from which moisture largely escapes into the air so long it continues to extend and multiply its roots in the soil beneath renewing and increasing the fresh surface for absorbing moisture in proportion to the demand from above and when growth ceases above ground and leaves die and fall or no longer act then the roots generally stop growing and their soft and tender tips harden from this period therefore until growth begins anew the next spring is the best time for transplanting especially for trees and shrubs the absorbing surface of young roots is much increased by the formation near their tips of root hairs which are delicate tubular outgrowths from the surface through the delicate walls of which moisture is promptly imbibed fleshy roots are those in which the root becomes a storehouse of nourishment typical roots of this kind are those of such biennials as the turnip and carrot in which the food created in the first season's vegetation is accumulated to be extended the next season in a vigorous growth and rapid development of flowers fruit and seed by the time the seed is matured 
the exhausted root dies, and with it the whole plant. Fleshy roots may be single or multiple. The single root of the commoner biennials is the primary root, or taproot, which begins to thicken in the seedling. Names are given to its shapes, such as conical, when it thickens most at the crown, or where it joins the stem, and tapers regularly downwards to a point, as in the parsnip and carrot. Turnip-shaped or napiform when greatly thickened above, but abruptly becoming slender below, as the turnip, and spindle-shaped or fusiform, when thickest in the middle and tapering to both ends, as in the common radish. These examples are of primary roots. It will be seen that turnips, carrots, and the like are not pure root throughout, for the colical, from the lower end of which the root grew, partakes of the thickening. Perhaps also some joints of stem above, so the bud-bearing and growing top is stem. A fine example of secondary roots, some of which remain fibrous for absorption, while a few thicken and store up food for the next season's growth, is furnished by the sweet potato. As stated above, these are used for propagation by cuttings, for any part will produce adventitious buds and shoots. The dahlia produces fascicled, i.e. clustered, fusiform roots of the same kind, at the base of the stem. But these, like most roots, do not produce adventitious buds. The buds by which dahlias are propagated belong to the surviving base of the stem above. Anomalous roots, as they may be called, are those which subserve other uses than absorption, food storing, and fixing the plant to the soil. Aerial roots, those that strike from stems in the open air, are common in moist and warm climates, as in the mangrove, which reaches the coast of Florida, the banyan, and less strikingly in some herbaceous plants, such as sugar cane, and even in Indian corn. Such roots reach the ground at length, or tend to do so. Aerial rootlets are abundantly produced by many climbing plants, such as the ivy, poison ivy, trumpet creeper, etc., springing from the side of stems, which they fasten to trunks of trees, walls, or other supports. These are used by the plant for climbing. Epiphytes, or air plants, are called by the former name because commonly growing upon the trunks or limbs of other plants, by the latter because having no connection with the soil, they must derive their sustenance from the air only. They have aerial roots, which do not reach the ground, but are used to fix the plant to the surface upon which the plant grows. They also take a part in absorbing moisture from the air. Parasitic plants, of which there are various kinds, strike their roots, or what answer to roots, into the tissue of foster plants, or form attachments with their surface, so as to prey upon their juices. Of this sort is the mistletoe, the seed of which germinates on the bough, where it falls or is left by birds, and the forming root penetrates the bark and engrafts itself into the wood to which it becomes united as firmly as a natural branch to its parent stem and indeed the parasite lives just as if it were a branch of the tree it grows and feeds on a most common parasitic herb is the daughter which abounds in low grounds in summer and coils its long and slender leafless yellowish stems resembling tangled threads of yarn round and round the stalks of other plants wherever they touch piercing the bark with minute and very short rootlets in the form of suckers, which draw out the nourishing juices of the plants laid hold of. Other parasitic plants, like the beech drops and pine sap, fasten their roots underground upon the roots of neighboring plants and rob them of their juices. Some plants are partly parasitic, while most of their roots act in the ordinary way Others make suckers at their tips, which grow fast to the roots of other plants and rob them of nourishment. 
Some of our species of Gerardia do this. There are phanerogamous plants like Monotropa or Indian pipe, the roots of which feed mainly on decaying vegetable matter in the soil. These are saprophytes, and they imitate mushrooms and other fungi in their mode of life. Duration of Roots, etc. Roots are said to be either annual, biennial, or perennial. As respects the first and second, these terms may be applied either to the root or to the plant. Annuals, as the name denotes, live for only one year, generally for only a part of the year. They are, of course, herbs. They spring from the seed, blossom, mature their fruit and seed, and then die, root and all. Annuals of our temperate climates with severe winters start from the seed in spring and perish at or before autumn. Where the winter is a moist and growing season and the summer is dry, winter annuals prevail. Their seeds germinate under autumn or winter rains, grow more or less during winter, blossom, fructify, and perish in the following spring or summer. Annuals are fibrous rooted. Biennials, of which the turnip, beet, and carrot are familiar examples, grow the first season without blossoming, usually thicken their roots, laying up in them a stock of nourishment, are quiescent during the winter, but shoot vigorously, blossom, and seed the next spring or summer, mainly at the expense of the food stored up, and then die completely. Annuals and biennials flower only once, hence they have been called monocarpic that is once fruiting plants perennials live and blossom year after year a perennial herb in a temperate or cooler climate usually dies down to the ground at the end of the season's growth but subterranean portions of stem charged with buds survive to renew the development shrubs and trees are of course perennial even the stems and branches above ground live on and grow year after year. There are all gradations between annuals and biennials, and between these and perennials, as also between herbs and shrubs, and the distinction between shrubs and trees is quite arbitrary. There are perennial herbs, and even shrubs of warm climates, which are annuals when raised in a climate which has a winter being destroyed by frost the castor oil plant is an example there are perennial herbs of which only small portions survive as offshoots or in the potato as tubers etc end of section five recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio interface audio dot com Section 6 of The Elements of Botany. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lawrence Trask, Mount Vernon, Ohio, InterfaceAudio.com. The Elements of Botany by Asa Gray. Section 6 Stems. The stem is the axis of the plant, the part which bears all the other organs. Branches are secondary stems, that is, stems growing out of stems. The stem at the very beginning produces roots. In most plants, a single root from the base of the embryo stem or colicle. As this root becomes a descending axis, so the stem, which grows in the opposite direction, is called the ascending axis. Rising out of the soil, the stem bears leaves, and leaf-bearing is the particular characteristic of the stem. But there are forms of stems that remain underground, or make a part of their growth there. These do not bear leaves, in the common sense, yet they bear rudiments of leaves, or what answers to leaves, although not in the form of foliage. The so-called stemless or acalescent plants are those which bear no obvious stem, collis, above ground, but only flower stalks and the like. Stems above ground, 
through differences in duration texture and size form herbs shrubs trees etc or in other terms are herbaceous dying down to the ground every year or after blossoming suffrutescent slightly woody below their surviving from year to year suffruticose or frutescent when low stems are decidedly woody below but herbaceous above fruticose or shrubby woody living from year to year and of considerable size not however more than three or four times the height of a man arborescent when tree-like in the appearance or mode of growth or approaching a tree in size arboreous when forming a proper tree trunk as to direction taken in growing stems may instead of growing upright or erect be diffuse that is loosely spreading in all directions declined when turned or bending over to one side decumbent reclining on the ground as if too weak to stand a surgent or ascending rising obliquely upwards procumbent or prostrate lying flat on the ground from the first creeping or repent prostrate on or just beneath the ground and striking root as does the white clover the partridge berry etc climbing or scandent ascending by clinging to other objects for support whether by tendrils as do the pea grapevine and passion flower and virginia creeper by their twisting leaf stalks as the virgin's bower or by rootlets like the ivy poison ivy and trumpet creeper twining or voluble when coiling spirally around other stems or support like the morning glory and the hop certain kinds of stems or branches appropriated to special uses certain kinds of stems or branches appropriated to special uses have received distinct substantive names such as the following a comb or straw stem such as that of grasses and sedges a codex is the old name for such a peculiar trunk as a palm stem it is also used for an upright and thick rootstock a sucker is a branch rising from stems under the ground such are produced abundantly by the rose raspberry and other plants said to multiply by the root if we uncover them we see at once the great difference between these subterranean branches and real roots they are only creeping branches under the ground remarking how the upright shoots from these branches become separate plants simply by the dying off of the connecting underground stems the gardener expedites the result by cutting them through with his spade that is he propagates the plant by division a stolen is a branch from above ground which reclines or becomes prostrate and strikes root usually from the nodes wherever it rests on the soil thence it may send up a vigorous shoot which has roots of its own and becomes an independent plant when the connecting part dies as it does after a while the currant and the gooseberry naturally multiply in this way as well as by suckers which are the same thing only the connecting part is concealed underground stolons must have suggested the operation of layering by bending down and covering with soil branches which do not naturally make stolons and after they have taken root as they almost always will the gardener cuts through the connecting stem and so converts a rooting branch into a separate plant an offset is a short stolon or sucker with a crown of leaves at the end as in the house leek which propagates abundantly in this way a runner of which the strawberry presents the most familiar and characteristic example is a long and slender tendril-like stolon or branch from next the ground destitute of conspicuous leaves each runner of the strawberry after having grown to its full length strikes root from the tip 
which fixes it to the ground, then forms a bud there, which develops into a tuft of leaves, and so gives large space, or produce a great number of plants in the course of the summer, all connected at first by the slender runners. But these die in the following winter, if not before, and leave the plants as so many separate individuals. Tendrils are branches of a very slender sort, like runners, not destined like them for propagation, and therefore always destitute of buds or leaves, being intended only for climbing. Simple tendrils are such as those of passion flowers. Compound or branching tendrils are borne by the cucumber and pumpkin, by the grapevine, Virginia creeper, etc. A tendril commonly grows straight and outstretched until it reaches some neighboring support, such as a stem, when its apex hooks around it to secure a hold. Then the whole tendril shortens itself by coiling up spirally, and so draws the shoot of the growing plant nearer to the supporting object. But the tendrils of the Virginia creeper, as also the shorter ones of the Japanese species, affect the object differently namely by expanding the tips of the tendrils into a flat disc with an adhesive face this is applied to the supporting object and it adheres firmly then a shortening of the tendril and its branches by coiling brings up the growing shoot close to the support this is an adaptation for climbing mural rocks or walls or the trunks of trees to which ordinary tendrils are unable to cling the ivy and poison ivy attain the same result by means of aerial rootlets. Some tendrils are leaves or parts of leaves as those of the pea. The nature of the tendril is known by its position. A tendril from the axle of a leaf, like that of passion flowers, is of course a stem, i.e. a branch. So is one which terminates a stem, as in the grapevine. Spines or thorns are commonly stunted and hardened branches or tips of stems or branches, as are those of the hawthorn, honey locust, etc. In the pear and sloe, all gradations occur between spines and spine-like, spinescent branches. Spines may be reduced and indurated leaves, as in the barberry, where their nature is revealed by their situation, underneath an axillary bud but prickles such as those of blackberry and roses are only excrescences of the bark and not branches equally strange forms of stems are characteristic of the cactus family these may be better understood by comparison with subterranean stems and branches these are very numerous and various but they are commonly overlooked or else are confounded with roots from their situation they are out of ordinary sight, but they will well repay examination. For the vegetation that is carried on underground is hardly less varied or important than that above ground. All their forms may be referred to four principal kinds, namely the rhizoma, rhizome, or rootstock, the tuber, the corm, or solid bulb, and the true bulb. The rootstock, or rhizoma, in its simplest form, is merely a creeping stem or branch growing beneath the surface of the soil or partly covered by it. Of this kind are so-called creeping, running, or scaly roots, such as those by which the mint, the couch grass, or quick grass, and many other plants spread so rapidly and widely by the root, as it is said that these are really stems and not roots is evident from the way in which they grow from their consisting of a succession of joints and from the leaves which they bear on each node in the form of small scales just like the lowest ones on the upright stem next to the ground they also produce buds in the axils of these scales showing the scales to be leaves whereas real roots bear neither leaves nor axillary buds placed as they are in the damp and dark soil such stems naturally produce roots just as the creeping stem does where it lies on the surface of the ground 
it is easy to see why plants with these running rootstocks take such rapid and wide possession of the soil and why they are so hard to get rid of they are always perennials the subterranean shoots live over the first winter if not longer and are provided with vigorous buds at every joint some of these buds grow in spring into upright stems bearing foliage to elaborate nourishment and at length produce blossoms for reproduction by seed while many others fed by nourishment supplied from above form a new generation of subterranean shoots and this is repeated over and over in the course of the season or in succeeding years meanwhile as the subterranean shoots increase in number the older ones connecting the successive growths die off year by year liberating the already rooted side branches as so many separate plants and so on indefinitely cutting these running rootstocks into pieces therefore by the hoe or the plow far from destroying the plant only accelerates the propagation it converts one many-branched plant into a great number of separate individuals cutting into pieces only multiplies the pest for each piece is already a plantlet with its roots and with a bud in the axil of its scale-like leaf either latent or apparent and with prepared nourishment enough to develop this bud into a leafy stem and so a single plant is all the more speedily converted into a multitude whereas when the subterranean parts are only roots cutting away the stem completely destroys the plant except in the rather rare cases where the root freely produces adventitious buds rootstocks are more commonly thickened by the storing up of considerable nourishing matter in their tissue the common species of iris in the gardens have stout rootstocks which are only partly covered by the soil and which bear foliage leaves instead of mere scales closely covering the upper part while the lower produces roots as the leaves die year after year and decay a scar left in the form of a ring marks the place where each leaf was attached that is marks so many nodes separated by very short internodes some rootstocks are marked with large round scars of a different sort like those of solomon's seal which gave this name to the plant from their looking somewhat like the impression of a seal upon wax here the rootstock sends up every spring an herbaceous stalk or stem which bears the foliage and flowers and dies in autumn the seal is the circular scar left by the death and separation of the base of the stout stalk from the living rootstock as but one of these is formed each year they mark the limits of a year's growth the bud at the end of the rootstock in the figure which was taken in summer will grow the next spring into the stalk of the season which dying in autumn will leave a similar scar while another bud will be formed farther on crowning the ever advancing summit or growing end of the stem as each year's growth of stem makes its own roots it becomes independent of the older parts and after a certain age a portion eventually dies off behind about as fast as it increases at the growing end death following life with equal and certain step with only a narrow interval in vigorous plants of solomon's seal or iris the living rootstock is several inches or a foot in length while in the short rootstock of trillium or birthroot life is reduced to a narrower span an upright or short rootstock like this of trillium is commonly called a codex or when more shortened and thickened it would become a corm a tuber may be understood to be a portion of a rootstock thickened and with buds eyes on the sides of course there are all gradations between a tuber and a rootstock helianthus tuberosus the so-called jerusalem artichoke and the common potato are typical and familiar examples of the tuber the stalks by which the tubers are attached to the parent stem are at once seen to be different from the roots both in appearance and manner of growth 
the scales on the tubers are rudiments of the leaves the eyes are the buds in their axils the potato plant has three forms of branches one those that bear ordinary leaves expanded in the air to digest what they gather from it and what the roots gather from the soil and convert it into nourishment two after a while a second set of branches at the summit of the plant bear flowers which form fruit and seed out of a portion of the nourishment which the leaves underground and accumulated in the form of starch at their extremities which become tubers or depositories of prepared solid food just as in the turnip carrot and dahlia it is deposited in the root the use of the store of food is obvious enough in the autumn the whole plant dies except the seeds if it formed them and the tubers and the latter are left disconnected in the ground just as that small portion of nourishing matter which is deposited in the seed feeds the embryo when it germinates so the much larger portion deposited in the tuber nourishes its buds or eyes when they likewise grow the next spring into new plants and the great supply enables them to shoot with a greater vigor at the beginning and to produce a greater amount of vegetation than the seedling plant could do in the same space of time which vegetation in turn may prepare and store up in the course of a few weeks or months the largest quantity of solid nourishing material in a form most available for food taking advantage of this man has transported the potato from the cool andes of chile to other cool climates and makes it yield him a copious supply of food especially important in countries where the season is too short or the summer's heat too little for profitably cultivating the principal grain plants the corm or solid bulb like that of cyclamen and of indian turnip is a very short and thick fleshy subterranean stem often broader than high it sends off roots from its lower end or rather face leaves and stalks from its upper the corm of cyclamen goes on to enlarge and to produce a succession of flowers and leaves year after year that of indian turnip is formed one year and is consumed the next figure 104 represents it in early summer having below the corm of last year from which the roots have fallen it is partly consumed by the growth of the stem for the season and the corm of the year is forming at the base of the stem above the line of roots the corm of crocus like that of its relative gladiolus is also reproduced annually the new ones forming upon the summit and sides of the old such a corm is like a tuber in budding from the sides i e from the axils of leaves but these leaves instead of being small scales are the sheathing bases of foliage leaves which covered the surface it resembles a true bulb in having these sheaths or broad scales but in the corm or solid bulb this solid part or stem makes up the principal bulk the bulb strictly so called is a stem like a reduced corm as to its solid part or plate while the main body consists of thickened scales which are leaves or leaf bases these are like bud scales so that in fact a bulb is a bud with fleshy scales on an exceedingly short stem compare a white lily bulb with the strong scaly buds of the hickory and horse chestnut and the resemblance will appear in corms as in tubers and rootstocks the store of food for future growth is deposited in the stem while in the bulb the greater part is deposited in the bases of the leaves changing them into thick scales which closely overlap or enclose one another a scaly bulb is one in which the scales are thick but comparatively narrow a tunicated or coated bulb is one in which the scales enwrap each other forming concentric coats or layers as in hyacinth and onion a tunicated or coated bulb is one in which the scales enwrap each other forming concentric coats or layers as in hyacinth and onion bulblets are very small bulbs growing out of larger ones 
or small bulbs produced above ground on some plants as in the axils of the leaves of the bulbiferous lilies of the gardens and often in the flower clusters of the leek and onion they are plainly buds with thickened scales they never grow into branches but detach themselves when full grown fall to the ground and take root there to form new plants consolidated vegetation an ordinary herb shrub or tree is evidently constructed on the plan developing an extensive surface in fleshy rootstocks tubers corms and bulbs the more enduring portion of the plant is concentrated and reduced for the time of struggle as against drought heat or cold to a small amount of exposed surface and this is mostly sheltered in the soil there are many similar consolidated forms which are not subterranean thus plants like the house leek imitate a bulb among cactuses the columnar species of cereus may be likened to rootstocks a green rind serves the purpose of foliage but the surface is as nothing compared with an ordinary leaf plant of the same bulk compare for instance the largest cactus known the giant cereus of the gila river which rises to the height of fifty or sixty feet with a common leafy tree of the same height such as that in figure eighty nine and estimate how vastly greater even without the foliage the surface of the latter is than that of the former compare in the same view an opuntia or prickly pear cactus its stem and branches formed of a succession of thick and flattened joints which may be likened to tubers or an epiphyllum having short and flat joints with an ordinary leafy shrub or herb of equal size and finally in melon cactuses echinocactus or other globose forms which may be likened to permanent corms with their globular or bulb-like shapes we have plants in the compactest shape their spherical figure being such as to expose the least possible amount of substance to the air these are adaptations to climates which are very dry either throughout or for a part of the year similarly bulbous and corm bearing plants and the like are examples of a form of vegetation which in the growing season may expand a large surface to the air and light while during the period of rest the living vegetable is reduced to a globe or solid form of the least possible surface and this protected by its outer coats of dead and dry scales as well as by its situation underground such are also adapted to a season of drought they largely belong to countries which have a long hot season of little or no rain when their stalks and foliage above and their roots beneath early perishing the plants rest securely in their compact bulbs filled with nourishment and retaining their moisture with great tenacity until the rainy season comes round then they shoot forth leaves and flowers with wonderful rapidity and what was perhaps a desert of arid sand becomes green with foliage and gay with blossoms almost in a day end of section six recording by lawrence trask mount vernon ohio